Hey, Jolene. This is a special one for me, man. What you mean? Special, special one for me, man. Um, what you mean? Hold on, man. One drum lady. One drum lady. Just keep doing man, the clothes. She got, she got the, she got the, the, she got the eye, eye in the bottom, yeah. the bottom wrinkle. Yeah, we don't need to be that. Yeah, we trying to make sure your yeah, shit man, right. Respect, yeah. Can't respect, have wrinkles on the Lewis, shit. man. You know what I mean? Yeah, we got to Yeah, I wasn't running you off, sweetheart. I just was making sure you had enough water in your steamer. You know? We're getting you straight over here, yeah, man. Yeah, making sure it's right. But like I said, man, this is a very special one for me because, you know, as, as everybody knows, as 85 percent as I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C. Stop playing. Yes, indeed. For what part? Uh, uptown to be exact. I think you want you to say it because yeah. they keep asking me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 you know, why they ask me shit? I mean, they know. Here, but this dude right here is a, a product of Washington, D.C. Um, you know, a lot of people are big on activism and, and being woke and helping black people now, but it's a lot of people that's been doing it before it was cool. And this brother's one of them, man. He's uh, from a neighborhood that I'm very familiar with. I went to a high school, Dunbar High School, that's you know close to his neighborhood, and this dude has always been active, always been a product of trying to stop a lot of the violence and a lot of the things that go on in our city, and it's being a, a helping hand to the streets. And it's something that I think needs to be you know, a spotlight needs to be put on this brother, man, a bigger one it already has, man. So I need everybody that's in here to make some noise for my big homie, Tony Lewis. Thank you, man. 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 It goes without saying, but that's exactly what this platform is for, exactly. man. It's to show love and respect to the people that we love and respect, man. So welcome to the trap, yeah, no, 85 here, South. Yeah. Chico holds you very high regard, yes, yes, man, yes. so you know. Sure. Um, well, talk, tell them a little bit about who you yeah, are, like man, you and say, your man, background. I'm, I'm from the nation's capital. Um, I've been a, a, a voice, uh, a supportive pillar in the community for the last 21 years. Um, I'm 40, right? So that's that's half my life. Uh, the work saved my life. Um, but, uh, but my history, as it relates to Washington, um, I come from, you know, and I say this with all, you know, sort of deference and humility, and not, I'm not somebody to glorify any of that, but I come from a, a, a street, Hanover Place, that was synonymous with the drug trade, really uh, sort of the first open-air drug market in our city. Uh, and my family members were very responsible for that, right? Uh, and my, my father would, would grow to be, um, again, you know, somebody who was regarded as a drug kingpin, went to prison when I was nine years old on the biggest drug conspiracy in the history of our city. Um, you know, and got life without the possibility of parole, right? Been in prison 32 years. Uh, that was significant for me, uh, changed the, tra the trajectory of my life. My mother uh, pretty much, you know, started to battle severe mental illness. We growing up in, and in D.C., you know, crack impacted the whole country, every urban community in the country, but nowhere, uh, it didn't imp impact anywhere like what it did to D.C., right? Um, you know, when you talk about incarceration rates, uh, addiction, uh, murder rates, um, infant mortality, all of, the, all of that data speaks to uh, how the crack epidemic uh, uh, punished us in our generation, right? right, right. right? Um, and so I was able to navigate through something that most people wasn't, weren't, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and being able to become a public servant, uh, a violence interrupter, being able to become uh, the person that when men and women return from incarceration that I was there, uh, along with others, obviously, right, to help uh, mm -hmm. get people stable to uh, make sure that when those mothers and fathers return to the community that they wouldn't leave again. Um, somebody who, who spoke up, uh, you know, in the correlation between another thing D.C. has become sort of the gentrification capital of the, of the, of the, of the country, right? right. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a real parallel between being the crack capital or in the murder capital through the 90s and now what we're seeing with gentrification. So I've been a bridge, I've been a translator, um, I've been um, somebody who uh, has ensured that legislation and policy uh, changed in, in order to preserve That's the real. and protect. Yeah, because it's not just about making noise with me, right? It ain't just about making noise. It's about uh, being able to deliver uh, solutions, 
and holding people that, that are in positions to change things accountable for doing that. Um, we, in, in the age of uh, social media, which is an amazing thing, right? I don't, right. I love it, right? I think it, it's, a, it's able, uh, enable people to connect, uh, which is beautiful. But I think um, I come from a place where activism is personal. Right. Activism is something you do every day. Um, and you gotta have a base, right? So if you walk through D.C., you know, people out there may never heard of me, but if you walk through D.C. with me, um, you know, I'm probably one of the most recognizable people uh, because I've helped people, right? Thousands of people, I've helped them. People from grandma to the kids to the uncle who just came home from doing 30, 20, 30 years, I've done something for them. Um, and I say that to say this, um, is that I take a lot of pride in that, right? Um, and sometimes the work and being so... Um, attached and connected to the to the issues is really gotten in the way sometimes of me being able to do things like this. So I'm just so happy um, and honored to be here, uh, uh, and, and I really uh, salute and respect what you guys do. Um, you said something that stuck out to me. You say you're a violence interrupter. Yeah. Speak on it. Yeah. So. But so, before you even go, I want to say something to that too, because that's the point that I was going to make. Uh, in the city that we come from, DC is a very violent city yeah. by nature you know what i mean that's we why when up, he said a violence yeah we grow up you know very violent you know what i'm saying and i come out of the streets and was active and lost plenty of family members that you know that i love and hold dear to me that and shed blood in those streets and what a lot of people don't understand is we have a hard time respecting people who don't come from where we come from and don't understand the things that we go through no matter where you're from you could be an activist from Atlanta or activists from Chicago, but if you don't know the streets of DC and how things operate in the DC, we're not trying to hit it. So him being a person that can say he's a violence interrupter, it speaks to his character because he come from the streets and he's respected in that space. Yeah. So when he walks into these neighborhoods, people look at him as somebody who understands what we going through and That's what we dealing language. with. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. They're under, they, it's not just coming in for the photo op or coming in to be able to say, I was here and I did this for a quota. He actually coming in because he understands that what you going through, I'm going through. And if you lose your uncle or aunt, or your brother and sister, I know what you gonna feel because I felt that pain. Right. And that's very rare in our city. So, Absolutely. you know what I mean? Nah, yeah, I appreciate that, but that's, that's it, right? And so being able to be in a position to save lives, right? Or at least attempt, right? And have that sort of buy-in and connectivity where at least somebody will come to the table at least to try to squash something, right? right. That could lead to somebody le uh, losing their life. And then growing that to being able to Im influence legislation that would create programming that, cause so now when I walk in the community or there's other people that came behind me, uh, being able to have something actually to offer too, right? So put, p put that gun down, but pick this up. Right, having programming that's leading to uh, uh, family sustaining employment, uh, entrepreneurial opportunities and grants for businesses, um, housing support, things of that nature, right, where it's comprehensive. And because we, we really, we trying to change lives, right? We trying to save lives. Uh, as a reentry professional, the same thing, uh, being able to, you know, create relationships with the business community, uh, relationships with, uh, you know, uh, government where, uh, opportunities can be created for men and women that we call returning citizens. Right. And, you know, I spoke, I spoke about my father being in, um, and me and my dad have been able to collaborate on many levels around violence interruption, right? We've done PSAs uh, to young people. He was one of the most, you know, respected people in the history of the streets, right, in my city. Right. And even nationwide in a lot of ways, right? Give and me he, a little background on your father. So, you know, because so, there's a lot of people watching. Sure. My, my father, know. Tony Lewis Sr., um, as I spoke to, I uh, went to prison in 1989 on a drug conspiracy. Um, a 29-person drug conspiracy, and, and, and at this point, there's not a, uh, no all the other 28 people. Uh, no, nobody's no longer serving any time. Um, his partner, Rayful Edmond, whom people are more familiar with, um, who who continued into criminality after they got incarcerated uh, and caught a new charge, uh, and then became a government informant, uh, got his sentence reduced. Um, on their original case. So he's no longer serving time for that particular case, right? And that's important because my father is still the only person with his original sentence, right? Everybody else is home, um, and none of those people have reoffended either. They've come home and done the right thing. Uh, and so, like, um, you know, but we've done so many restorative and redemptive acts, squashing beefs, uh, helping uh, children with incarcerated parents, uh, getting the guys that's locked up with him 
uh, uh, connecting their families with resources in the community, helping those guys when they come home. And you know, and I think in, in, in this country, we gotta really ask ourselves, if we can reward um, somebody sending 100 people to jail, we should be able to also reward somebody who stopped 100, 200, 300 people from coming to jail and stopped maybe another four, 500 from returning, right? right? Um, and those, those are, that's the kind of work that I've been able to leverage. You know, me and my dad, is, I'm, I'm, I feel like the luckiest man in the world because, you know, man, incarceration break all bonds, man. You know what I'm saying? We've been in this shit 32 years and to still had a bond that we have and to be able to help the people that we've helped. I've been able to go into his facility. And this is a federal facility we'll be talking about. That's unheard of. And sit down with him with cameras like this and interview. Um, come in, bring council members in to see the programs that he was like the vice chair of, which mentor younger inmates and all these things. So um, in 32 years, he only had like two disciplinary incidents, very, very minor, been a model inmate. You know what I mean? And again, um, I'm not naive. My father's remorseful. My father broke the law, so the shitload of cocaine. Um, but he's not in jail for a violent offense, right? Uh, in 32 years, and I'm out, I'm out in the community, in my work. In my work, home. Listen, <laughs> I work with people coming home from prison. I've stated that, right? But what I, I got it's important to, to, to note this. I see the whole game. I've sat just in my office, child molesters, rapists, murderers, you know, people that even killed their own grandmother, right? But they ain't, that's not on me to judge. My point, though, is that if, if, if those egregious uh, crimes can, can be, people can get a second chance, how can my father not get a second chance for selling drugs, right? Uh, uh, and even, even and again, not to negate or minimize the impact of selling drugs, right? But we know that cocaine coming into this country Right, the data is there now. Right, we know this. You're funded by, you know, I mean, you know, the CIA and and, and, and to fund wars and the, the Contras and all. we know this. We know, right? Um, young black men, y'all. I can see the Capitol, the dome. Like I live ten blocks from the Capitol. You know what I'm saying? How can my street be the uh, open air drug market and just be able to happen like that? Young black men get held responsible for that. The collateral damage. Right? Yeah. Uh, it get, but, but the people, other <clears throat> people don't. So we pay out debt to society. I'm just saying that to say to frame the fact that my father, 32 years is enough for whatever he's done. The other thing, I mean, um, when they went to prison, right? And you guys can look this up. When they went to prison, and we can talk about El Chapo, Meech, whoever. Nobody, I've never seen anybody housed at a military base. I've actually been to Quantico military base. <laughs> They got flown by military helicopter to and from court, okay? I had to visit my father at a cell because a, a Marine base ain't got no visiting hall, right? I've been to the cell. My father on one side of the bars, I'm on this end, and it's, it's Marines with M16s. Rafer was 24, my father was 26, right? Um, again, they should have went to prison, but to get him life without parole, and, and at that time, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, Biden's role in the 1994 crime bill, but there was a crime bill in 1986, the crime bill that, that really uh, created the 100 to 1 disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, right? Um, and so when you look at how many thousands of black and brown people got sent to prison, right, in a disproportionate way because of these laws, and people get so caught up, like, I've never said my father shouldn't have went to prison. Never said that, but how do you take a young man, 26 years old, who never had been to prison before, and you give him life without parole? And I mean, I think people who don't go through this don't think about what that means, life without parole. And it was a show, too. Yeah, I mean, they a had, whole scene, they bulletproof courtroom, bulletproof courtroom, sequestered jury. The they had Rafael and Kurt Bone, all them niggas walking out the helicopter with handcuffs on, mm -hmm. and you know, what I mean, all types of shit. It was just a time in the city, and then right after that. The murder rate skyrocketed. The whole, let me, which is this is why that's key. I'm not just. I just want to say something about how important that is. When you said that this group was responsible for all the violence, all the drugs, when they went to jail, the city got so much worse. Crazy. We, I grew up. If you look at the murder rates in Washington D.C. between they went to jail in '89. If you look at the murder rates from 1990 to to 2000. I went from 10 years old to 20. It's about it's about 4,300 murders in Washington, right? And you know, but but see, this is what I'm saying. This is what these narratives had become about young black men. You know that that this one group, and then it, it went from them to another uh, uh, R Street. Then it went to P Street. Then it went to First Street. Then it went to the 15th place. You know, it's, and they build these federal cases 
um, and make the, these groups out of the sole source of all the problems in our community. And nobody talks about the divestment in the community. Nobody talk about uh, the lack of opportunity and access to jobs and all these other things that play into these individuals, um, um, you know, coming into being. Right. And, and yeah, it's about accountability, but I don't make excuses. But we also got to give context to why these decisions was made. You know what I'm saying? My father grew up on Hanover Place just like I did. No father. Well, you know, the, the quote unquote story that we hear. But people still got to act. Don't got can't act like that shit don't matter. And you can say, you know, and they tell us shit like that. Go get a job. Right. But where who who work around here? Don't nobody, don't nobody work. And again, you'll hear me reference in terms of my life and how I feel so lucky, because yeah, everybody around me against it, if so-called, right? Everybody, my family, this is a family dynamics. But people had dreams and hopes about me in my neighborhood and in my household. But it still wasn't nobody I could point to to say, okay, this is how you do it. What? And I don't think people understand how important that piece is, right? Man. Somebody to model you, somebody to ask questions. You dig? Like, these are the things that, um, you know, and for me, I could have probably done anything I wanted to do in the street, but I had a dad that was doing life without parole telling me every day, Holmes, you don't want this. And in the first 14 years, he was in a place called Long Park, California, right? That's about an hour away from Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? How many times you think I went out to California? You know what I mean? I went out there in 92, 96, 99. I'm growing up. I just told y'all what's going on in D.C. in them years where I'm growing up. My father, 3,000 miles away. My mother back and forth to, to over St. Elizabeth. You know what I mean? Because she lost her. My, mother, my father went to jail. My mother lost her mind. My mother yeah. lost her mind. She couldn't cope with the stress. Then we got car, a dude carjacked us, um, you know, which was also symbolic. He took the 190 bins of like the last little remnant of our old life, right, in terms of like a material thing. But more importantly, it showed that that would have never happened before. We, we weren't protected. Our protection was gone. We was just like everybody else. And he took her sanity with her, with him, when he took the car. She pumping the gas, he getting the joint just like you. Get up, you know what I'm saying? Put the joint to me. I'm 10. My mother snatched me out the car, though, and he just pull off with the joint. And my mother never was the same. So I, had to, I grew up with my father locked up, my mother back and forth to the mental institution. You know what I'm saying? And even to this day, homes like, I have to, I got two little girls. Right. And, and, and in order for them to have a relationship with their grandparents, I try, but my father's still locked up and my mother's still going through her thing. You know what I mean? So deep, and, and when I wrote this book, it was about showing the fullness. You spoke some the collateral damage of mass incarceration and the far reaching impacts that it's had on our community. Not just the person that's locked up. Right. But how it destabilized our community probably more than anything. A, commu a community like mine, not, me, not being D.C., but an impoverished community where incarceration is so normalized. Yeah. And Nothing this, has destabilized. And look at the story you're telling. This is just one family. This and I'm, and I'm on, what I'm saying. On this, microcosm and we're, of, and we're talking about come on, bro. everybody. Because I'm class of people. I, I give my mother that. so much credit for not losing her mind when my father was murdered. Because he was murdered in the streets of D.C. And she was able to keep her sanity after her first child's father was gunned down and just being in that environment what you just said about not having nobody to follow my whole family was in the streets everybody and i'm talking about i didn't have anybody to look to for any example that was this is what it looks like to do it the way that they say you're sure. supposed to so it's that much more difficult for us because wherever you go it was always that that's why i give you so many flowers because Appreciate even that. when i was in a young and in high school i remember seeing you up Dunbar, I mean, passing out shit, and, and I remember this, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and it was, it was so unusual to see somebody that was not that much older than us that was like, nah, y'all tripping, because everybody else would be like, man, y'all niggas some suckers, y'all out here doing this peaceful shit, these yeah. niggas great, yeah. take over y'all whole whatever, and that, and that was the, the narrative, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So just to be, to have the heart to be different in right. that environment is something that's, you know what I mean? Kudos to you I for that, brother, it, for real. Thank you, man. Thank you. Like, I, I, saw the, I saw the carnage, though. Like, I seen the, I seen the carnage. I, it, it wasn't just about, I saw, I know where, it, where it's gonna go. It's gonna go two ways. You know what I mean? All my homies was in on bodies, or they, the ones that weren't in on bodies. We lost a lot of homies, because see, again, our generation, I saw, I saw that, and I knew that I could be a voice to maybe do something different. And I always was a leader anyway, you know, coming out my hood, you know? Uh, because the, the, in, in the Ville, I, I never was curious about the streets or, because I, I grew up in it. 
I didn't have to come off the porch. I was born off the porch. I had access to things. And so it's another part to this that people don't talk about. These rap dudes don't talk about it. These movies don't show it. I, I know the real that come along with this life. You know oh, what I mean? Boy. And no amount of my father's a millionaire, all that. Bo- but that when them people come get you, bro, don't none of that matter. I know none people of give you money. life without parole, that shit don't none of that matter. And all the people that was, you know, running behind you, this, that, and the third, them people disappear. You, you understand? The homies. You, when I was growing up, them dudes, wasn't nobody coming through Hanover checking on me and seeing was I all right. None of that. And when I started doing my thing, you know, so many of those guys, too, you know, they went to jail when they come home. Nephew, you know, and I don't, I don't know, bro. That's not the type of person I am. But my point is, um, to all the people out there in the street moving and go doing what they do, just know, homes, like when you, when you, I don't care what your intentions are, when you get locked up, right, or if the other thing happened, your family, your mother, your baby mother, your, your kids, they on their own. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's significant. The, the best thing you can be is present. Your youngest need, your babies need you. Like, I, need, I needed my father growing up. You know what I mean? Like, you know, even if people don't think about this, when shit happen, and you're, somebody in jail, like, you know, you can't call them. You know what I'm saying? You gotta wait for them to call. You know what I mean? Lord, yeah. you know what I mean? Hope so you're there to catch the call. You hear me? Hope you in the house when when yeah. they call. But but you know, we I've been around um, some you know, the people that from our town that people talk about. You know what I mean? I got these people are, are personal. I know these folks. I grew up under them, um, and so I just always wanted to bring a message. And, and one more thing, I know I I, I just I want to say that's important. What I've also tried to be was an example of you talked about that we don't take to people coming from outside. I want to be an example for a young dude in Atlanta, Chicago, LA, New York, that you have the power to change your community. Even as an activist, I don't want to, I don't care what issue going on. I don't want to pull up in your hood and speak for your hood. I want you to be uh, uh, the voice of your people in the struggle and the nuances and the layers, because I could never know that. If I ever had a platform where I could bring support to that, I would, I would like to come and support young activists or young dudes from the struggle, you know what I mean, and help them or share knowledge with them, but never to come and speak on their, on their behalf. Their voice is enough, right. you know what I'm saying? And I hope that young dudes and women uh, in these communities understand that. And what can people reach out to you, though? Like sure. it's, it's a lot of, we got a big platform right here, and there's a lot of people with resources, and you have yeah. a very moving, compelling story. It's going to be a lot of people that want to, link up with you and say, look, this is what I have. Like, how can I get in touch with, sure, you so, know, with, with Tony Lewis Jr. Yeah, and man. keep the movement going? Uh, so you can, you know, link up with some people that can actually bring more light to the movement. I, I hope I, this I is just it. the first stop. Yeah, you get for what sure, I'm for sure, bro. And I appreciate that, uh, you know, Instagram or whatever, Twitter, Mr. Tony Lewis Jr., MR Tony Lewis Jr., uh, freetonylewis.com. And we got a big rally coming up April 10th, um, you know, uh, petitioning the Biden administration for clemency for my father. Um, and it's a, it's a petition or you can sign on freetonyrules.com if you're in the DC area or you're willing to come to the DC area, we would love to have you. Yeah. Um, because we're trying to show, uh, the, and, and again, to your point, that our situation, right, is thousands of people in this country in that same boat. And that- If uh, not millions. If not, yeah, you know what I'm saying? And so this administration, um, needs to enact a robust clemency program to reunite American families. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and particularly this administration, how heavy handed um, the president was as a senator in the creation of the system that we have now, from the 86 bill to the 94 bill, right? right? And he ran on being able to right some of the wrongs, okay? And I think it's time, I want, you know, I think my dad uh, is, should be the poster child for that, to show that he's serious about that. Um, so April 10th in DC, again, freetonyrules.com, sign that petition, right. uh, you know. Uh, I know you've been active in getting a lot of young brothers, you know, out of jail. Yeah. It's like, so what, sure. what other resources would you say that you need to, to, that could help your cause? Yeah, um, <clears throat> really, really, for me, I think the most important thing um, is access, you know, opportunity to uh, be on platforms such as this one. Um, and people being able to call on their congressman, call on their senator, right? And the thing about for us in D.C., right, we don't have a voting member in Congress, nope. right? Um, but if you Access live in a state, representation. absolutely, right? So, so, but if you're in these states, you need to call on your congressman and your, this is what I need, and your senators to, to talk about reform, to talk about uh, clemency, call on the, on, on, on the White House, things like that is what, what we need. We need numbers. 
You know what I mean? Because this is a lot of black people be really, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's a it's a segment of black folk, man, that don't care nothing about people that be locked up. You know what I'm saying? No, I just, they feel like they just, you know, they, they broke the law and they deserve it and whatever happened to them happened. You know, even just right now with, 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 with COVID and people in prison, like with so much you saw that the public just don't think about. You, it's like, out, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Right. But, but people really, people that's locked up, like the walking dead, people don't think about them, even their family members. And so I want people to, to never lose sight of the humanity of the men and women, you know what I'm saying, that's, that's incarcerated. Bro. Man, I'm gonna say this, and I mean this, man. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, coming from the city, being born and raised in the city, and uh, knowing the type of, the energy that we need in our city that we always needed, you know what I mean? And just growing up and knowing it, like, man, you're gonna be the mayor. We need you to be the mayor of DC, man. Yeah, so, it, man. Hey, I, I, I say that, I say that with all sincerity because, you know, I always speak highly of Marion Barry. You know, the, the the a lot of the public perception is he was a crackhead. But I always say this jokingly, yeah, but if he was stuff. a crackhead, he was the greatest crackhead yeah, ever. No Cause about it. this nigga made sure that every teen in America, every teen in the city had a job. He made sure that, you know, a lot of the city was, a lot of the people who were able to move to Maryland Facts. and do all of that now was Created able to do that. the biggest black middle class the in America. Biggest black middle class yeah. ever in America, man. Yeah. Just from the history of what you've done in the city, from you walking them streets and being a part of it, man, I'm just honored to be a person that has come from the city to be able to help build a platform like this to shed light on you, Hell brother. Yeah, yeah. One day you're gonna be the mayor of DC, no, man. Give us a quick yeah. on the book. Let them know where they can get yeah, the book. Yeah, oh, 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 Amazon, um, iBook, Slug a Boy's Life in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Uh, again, follow me, Mr. Tony Lewis Jr., freetonylewis.com. Um, and this is the most comprehensive look at mass incarceration, man, uh, that there is. And I'm biased as hell, but that's the truth. Uh, so, yeah, man, Bro, free Tony you know, Lewis. On some real shit, don't let this be the last time you come in here and check us oh, out, man. I appreciate we that. We want bro. to use this platform to highlight your movement, and we're going to do everything we can. We're going to get we, Tony we, Lewis We got home, free Tony man. Lewis we until Tony, Tony Lewis, Lewis is free. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. that. Man. This is the 85 South Show. Carlos Miller. Chico Bay. Love. This is Mr. Tony Lewis right here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. Happy birthday. Hell yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you.